This episode of The Sweaty Penguin is brought to you by Slushies. Do you wish there was an appropriate drink for a 108-gallon plastic cup? Try Slushies today. Welcome to episode 73 of The Sweaty Penguin, Antarctica's hottest podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Brown. Today, we are talking about palm oil. Not to be confused with the sweat on your palms when you're about to shake hands at the beginning of a job interview. If you're not in the environmental world, you may be surprised to hear that palm oil is possibly one of the most contentious environmental issues out there. You may not even know what palm oil is. And yet so many important livelihoods and ecosystems are at stake due to palm oil. And as a result, you have a boycott palm oil movement, a sustainable palm oil movement, all these movements that feel very passionately about their proposal, so much so that I'm guessing they'll be frustrated that I will give each of them the time of day today. I mean, in terms of passion, palm oil activists are like Swifties, Beliebers, and Stone Cold Steve Austin fans all wrapped into one. My goal each week is really just to find common ground, so if everyone ends up hating me after this, I guess that's still a common opinion and I would have done my job. But we're gonna break down palm oil today. We'll discuss why palm oil is way more popular than you might realize, what environmental issues it causes, and what the pros and cons are of various potential solutions. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. If you want to take two minutes to help out the Sweaty Penguin, you can either leave us a five-star rating and review, or join our Patreon at patreon.com slash thesweatypenguin. Doing either earns you a special shout-out at the end of the show. Joining the Patreon gets you merch, bonus content, and a whole lot more. First, it's time for Palm Oil 101. Palm oil is a vegetable oil derived from the fruit of the oil palm, which is a plant indigenous to the coast of Western Africa that loves a warm, rainy climate. There's two types, crude palm oil, which comes from the flesh of the fruit, and palm kernel oil, which comes from the stone in the middle of the fruit. After extracting the oil, It gets refined at processing mills and then incorporated into close to 50% of the packaged products we find in the supermarket, including snack foods, cereals, cakes, processed foods, candy bars, cookies, Cheez-Its, Oreos, soaps, shampoos, and cosmetics. It's also used as animal feed and biofuel in some parts of the world. In fact, I think palm oil is in everything except gravel. That's right, meet your new crunchy snack. Plus, orthodontists don't put gravel on the banned food while wearing braces list, so even for teenagers, it's a win-win. Why is palm oil so popular? Well, and this doesn't diminish any of the issues we're going to discuss today, but palm oil can do a lot of cool things. It can sit, it can stay, it can roll over. Oh wait, no, that's four-year-olds. Palm oil is semi-solid at room temperature, so it can keep spreads spreadable. It is resistant to oxidation, meaning it can give products a longer shelf life. It's stable at high temperatures, which helps give fried products a crispy and crunchy texture. It also has moisturizing, foaming, solubilizing, softening, and texturizing properties that make it a useful addition to soaps and cosmetics. For every unanswered question in life, from how are Doritos this good, to how did that tiny squirt of shampoo expand all over my head, seemingly with no regard to the laws of physics, palm oil is the secret answer. So now you know. It's all downhill from here. But the other big reason we use palm oil is that it's the most land-efficient plant oil we have. Again, 
This fact doesn't change any of the important issues we're going to discuss. It's not a lesser of two evils, let's shrug it off type deal, the way Hilary Duff choosing How I Met Your Father over a Lizzie McGuire reboot was. But if we compare palm oil to its alternatives, palm oil can yield 3.3 tons per hectare, as opposed to sunflower oil, rapeseed oil, and coconut oil, all at 0.7 tons per hectare, and soybean oil at 0.4 tons per hectare, according to the World Wildlife Fund. And according to the Smithsonian, no other alternative can yield even a third as much oil per acre as oil palms. So for what it's worth, picking palm oil to be our favorite vegetable oil was actually somewhat of a smart idea. It's the execution of that idea where we see problems. What are these problems? First off, even though the oil palm is indigenous to Western Africa, it's primarily grown in Southeast Asia. Indonesia and Malaysia alone make up over 85% of the global palm oil production. According to the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil's Daryl Weber, that presents some challenges. So there's a thin band that goes around the equator, and that is the ideal area to grow oil palm. Uh, but it's also the area of highest biodiversity in the world. It's also the area of high poverty levels in the world. So because of all these very significant clashes will happen, right? Oil palm only grows in this thin band around the equator. And think about what's there. The Amazon rainforest in South America, the Congo Basin in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is full of rainforest, and if you pop slightly north, we've got Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, other heavily forested areas we've talked about on the podcast. And then we've got Indonesia and Malaysia close by when we travel to Asia, both countries with spectacular rainforests. So if we want to use palm oil at the capacity that we do, we need land in one of these areas. Indonesia and Malaysia ended up bearing the brunt of the burden on this specific issue. But no matter what, you're looking for land in one of the most vibrant and biodiverse forests of the world. I won't try to give you statistics on this deforestation, because I've seen numbers ranging from palm oil causing 0.2% of global deforestation to it causing 40% of global deforestation. And that's not very helpful. Those are vastly different numbers, even though 0.2% and 40% are both an F on a test, unless you're at Stanford and they rounded up to an A-. minus. That's why Daryl Weber's point about palm oil having to be grown near the equator is much more useful to me. Even without any numbers, we understand that deforestation is going to be part of the process. What does that deforestation mean? For one, it means habitat loss. Palm oil expansion could impact 54% of all threatened mammal species, and 64% of all threatened bird species. And keep in mind, the rainforests of Indonesia and Malaysia are not just full of cool animals like tigers, orangutans, rhinos, and elephants, but there are species that you actually can't find anywhere else in the world. Orangutans are one of them, as we've discussed in a past episode. 750 to 1,250 orangutans are killed every year in human orangutan conflicts, and agricultural practices such as palm oil farming are one of the primary contributors. It's worth noting that these effects aren't uniform. Smallholder farms often see higher biodiversity, and some smaller species such as snakes, rodents, and wild pigs can actually thrive in an oil palm plantation but let's be honest with ourselves. Are snakes, rodents, and pigs really as cool as orangutans? Unless you're Alfredo Linguini from Ratatouille, I think orangutans beat rats in any popularity contest. But it's not just about popularity, right? Middle school biology taught us two things. The mitochondria is the powerhouse of iFunny, and apex predators are essential to the food web. As such, tigers are crucial pieces to any ecosystem they're in. They keep the population of the smaller animals in control, which in turn allows the plant life that they would eat 
to thrive. Orangutans, we've discussed before, are the gardeners of the forest because they eat fruits and poop the seeds in new areas where trees then can grow. Elephants are sometimes called ecosystem engineers, not because they make assumptions about chemistry all the time, but because their footprints are big enough to actually provide shelter for tadpoles and other small organisms, and their big appetites actually end up clearing out pathways through dense forest. And that's just environmental. Economically, these species can also provide ecotourism revenue for these regions of the world. And speaking of ecosystem services, we can look at how these forests help humans. In the context of climate change, forests absorb carbon dioxide from the air and store it away in the trees and the soil. By pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere, the forests help combat climate change. Now I know what you're thinking. Ethan, we're not cutting down forests to build a Chuck E. Cheese or a Dick's Sporting Goods. We're planting oil palms, and those are going to absorb carbon too. It balances out. Unfortunately, not quite. Sure, oil palms absorb carbon quite well, all plants do. But that takes time. And by eliminating the carbon stores of the previous forests which have developed over hundreds of years you essentially set yourself back to square one. It may cancel out by the time Neo gets extracted from the Matrix or the Bengals get back to another Super Bowl, but that's well outside our lifetime, and climate change is here now. In fact, the 2021 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report stated that behind fossil fuel use, land use change for needs such as conversion from forest to oil farm is the second greatest contributor to human-induced climate change. Certainly not something worth playing around with. And here's where the climate impact gets more concerning. Obviously, no matter how you eliminate a forest, you've got a problem. But if we want to get a little into the nuance, you can think about how cutting down the trees and using the wood might at least do a little good. Not offsetting the carbon emissions by any stretch, but if you use the wood for construction or lumber or paper or give it to Bob the Builder, you at least get some economic value back. Maybe a different forest can stay intact because you got enough wood from this one. If you use the wood for biofuel, it's not great because wood burning actually emits even more carbon than coal, plus a bunch of other gunk, but at least you're creating energy. Again, these are just tiny little things you could toss into a prose column, nothing particularly consequential. But I say this because currently, a lot of palm oil deforestation doesn't even achieve that. Instead, many forests just get burned down. Not only does that eliminate any benefit we could squeeze out of these trees, not only does that mean a horrific demise for the endemic animals, but it's often illegal. That said, according to this documentary in Indonesia, it's happening anyway. Back in Kalimantan, Indonesian Borneo, police here have not yet managed to find a single arsonist. Who did this? They can't find the arsonists, or don't want to find them. But everything here was burnt down, even our fields and houses. Not only is it happening, but it's happening without consequence. And that's where this gets tricky. There are ways to enforce laws about slashing and burning forests. It's not impossible to catch an arsonist. But first off, that costs money, whether it's hiring patrollers or implementing technology. And second, think about who would burn a forest. You could imagine a person living in poverty seeing it as a last resort. You could imagine a palm oil company convincing government officials to turn the other cheek. I don't know if that happens, not accusing anyone. But hearing a local suggest that the police may not want to find the arsonists is really eye-opening certainly makes you think about a lot of possibilities. Keep in mind, too, these fires aren't just spewing carbon, but a whole bunch of other air pollutants, such as fine particulate matter, that lead to adverse human health effects in nearby communities. 
While it may be the most well-known, deforestation is far from the only issue facing palm oil. These tropical forests also contain a type of wetland called peatlands, which suck up huge amounts of carbon themselves, and during conversion to oil palm plantations, the peatlands get drained. Due to this peatland drainage, palm oil emits a hundred times more greenhouse gases than conventional forest fires. Oil palm plantations are also typically monocultures, or farms that produce only one plant. Monocultures notoriously require extra fertilizer, have pest problems, and degrade the soil they're on. And remember, this is some of the best soil in the world. This is the Keanu Reeves of soil. But these fertilizers and pesticides, if applied in excess, can ultimately become runoff, pollute nearby fresh water bodies, and harm aquatic biodiversity. And on top of all of that, we talked about some of the animals living in these tropical forests, but we missed the most important one, and the most likely one to give tongs a few test clicks to make sure they still work every time, and that is people. Indonesian national forests are home to over 2,000 indigenous communities whose lives are deeply intertwined with the forests. According to Forest People's Program's Marcus Colchester, these land disputes can turn very scary very quickly. You've got these clashes over land, sometimes with firearms being used, people being shot, unfortunately sometimes also being killed, and then people being criminalized and imprisoned for their actions, some of which you would say was perfectly legitimate protest, some of which you know has gone a bit beyond what, what was prudent because they're so desperate. Um, and so these things are, are pretty grim to witness, and you know there's lots of people who are in jail because they've been protesting about what they've realized was, to their minds now, the theft of their land under false pretenses, with false promises made of the benefits that would come. We can debate what's legitimate protest and what isn't, but ultimately, when you know that these people live on this land and have for generations, it's hard to really say anything is off the table. Marcus says they're desperate. Of course they're desperate. It's their land. So to think they're being jailed, shot, and killed in the name of palm oil is really disappointing. Marcus also mentions false promises on the benefits that would come. And maybe if there were an actual mutual agreement where indigenous people decided they wanted to use the land for palm oil and sell it themselves, they might see a benefit. They'd also see the cost of changing their entire way of life by cutting down the forest, not to mention the injuries and diseases that palm oil workers are routinely exposed to. But if they wanted to participate in the global palm oil market and make some money, fair enough. But right now, especially for industrial oil palm plantations, the economic gains go back to foreign investors. All of these factors make palm oil land grabs really contentious. So what do we do with all this? Which, by the way, barely even scratches the surface. How do we grapple with the fact that palm oil is used in so many products and every alternative vegetable oil requires more land? That's where this gets really tricky, and why palm oil has become a really controversial issue. I mean, how could it not? We're talking about the fate of Doritos. Sure, it's no big deal if we get rid of the Salsa Verde ones, but Cool Ranch? Nacho Cheese? Yeah, we need a plan. Now, a lot of the current discourse is whether to ban slash boycott palm oil or whether to advance sustainable palm oil. And these two groups seem to really not like each other. That's just my perception. I'm not advancing one cause or the other, just like I don't advance any specific solution on this podcast. But let's take these two ideas holistically and discuss their pros and cons. For a ban or boycott, you stop all these issues from worsening. We're not always the best at executing conservation. We have a terrible track record, as we'll discuss in a moment. So that may provide some relief. On the flip side, you have a few questions to ask. First, what happens to all the palm oil farmers around the world, many of whom are smallholder farmers? How do you support these smallholder farmers when they're suddenly out of work? 
And second, what is the alternative to palm oil? Is it a world with no soaps, cosmetics, snack foods, and all that good stuff? If so, that may create issues of hygiene, skin health, food availability. Who even knows what wiping out half the supermarket would do? That's essentially March 2020 all the time. Certainly, the economic ramifications wouldn't be pretty either, although I guess you'd have to weigh that against the economic gains of helping combat climate change and preserving very important ecosystems. Or is it a world in which these products have to find alternatives? If so, given just how many of these products there are, the amount of land you'd need to grow enough other vegetable oils would probably lead to a lot of similar issues. I haven't researched these other oils, they weren't essential, but hopefully we can do episodes on them in the future. That said, we've discussed, for example, that soybeans are a major driver of deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. Imagine if you had to replace palm oil with soybean oil, more land for an arguably worse product. Now, there are some cases where the alternatives seem a little better. When palm oil is used for animal feed or biofuel, that could be replaced by something other than another vegetable oil. What replacement? That depends on the circumstance. But I think that conversation is more nuanced than it's maybe given credit for. For sustainable palm oil, the promise is clear. We can continue using this great product, we just have to find a way to make it better. According to the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oils, Dan Streche, that's well within our power. The fact is, it's just a plant. It's how and where we've done it and how we've grown it that causes the problem. But that means that it's a human problem. We created the issue. That means that we also have the ability to, to solve that issue, to fix that issue. Now, I don't know that I fully buy the idea that just because humans caused a problem means they can fix it. Just ask Shanae on The Bachelor. But in this case, I take Dan's point that oil palms are just a plant. They don't fart methane, in fact, they suck carbon out of the atmosphere. There should be a way to do it that doesn't cut down forests, threaten important species, and warm the planet. And in theory, that sounds great. I think there's an argument either way, though, because the strip of earth that oil palms can grow on is a lot of forest. We can't just grow oil palm on a grassy field in Nebraska. It has to be by the equator. So when we talk about finding new land for oil palm without deforestation, that's actually a big challenge for palm oil to overcome. Another con that proponents of a ban will point out is that we've sort of tried sustainable palm oil already. The Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil is a massive certification scheme that now certifies around 19% of global palm oil. Unfortunately, the RSPO does not have provisions to enforce and verify member progress. They allow companies to use the certification if they mix certified oil with uncertified oil. And they didn't actually ban deforestation or peatland drainage. They just forbid it in what they call high conservation value areas, which has no legal definition. To call that sustainable palm oil would just be misleading. As a result, it's hard to say RSPO even came close to their goal. And while I think it's worth discussing either how they could get their ducks in a row or a competing certification scheme to up the ante, I also don't know how big of an impact that would have. It's not like coffee or vegetables where we're actually going to see, oh, this is fair trade or this is organic, and we'll be motivated to pay a few cents more because of that. In this case, we don't even know what products the palm oil is in. To keep an eye out for sustainable palm oil wouldn't even be on our minds. We'd be too busy thinking about the one wheel on the cart that won't stay straight when you have to turn into a narrow aisle. So the free market certification schemes may not be as effective in this particular case. And that may be part of why palm oil ban slash boycott proponents are so vocal. They see it, as you got to try your solution already, it failed, now we should get to try ours. 
The taking turns aspect doesn't convince me of much, but the history of the RSPO is certainly something I've kept front of mind. So all that sounds awful, right? It's not an easy problem to solve. Figuring this out is almost as hard as figuring out what that nuclear plant-looking thing was in the background of the Winter Olympics. I know they said it was a steel mill, but I'm here for the conspiracies. Let's keep digging. If you envision a future with some palm oil, whether it's done sustainably or it's reduced significantly, there may be some more low-hanging fruit than you might expect. You can split up policy to address the different uses of palm oil, rather than trying to deal with food, toiletries, animal feed, and biofuel in one fell swoop. You can preserve specific lands you deem especially important, something we've tried but struggle with. Certainly, plenty could be done to support smallholder farmers and indigenous communities. You can consider if oil palm plantations need to be monocultures, or if they can integrate other plants. There's even the possibility that synthetic alternatives made from algae or yeast could open up some possibilities in the future. And on top of all those ideas, we can look beyond the production process and find other ways to improve the supply chain. Remember how palm oil has to be refined at a processing mill? According to the PhD work of Stanford's Elsa Ordway, processing mills actually have a lot of room to improve themselves. Since palm oil has been produced in this region for so long, there's a lot of kind of backyard artisanal milling, even at the larger mechanized mills that some of the larger plantations run or larger companies run. They're lacking in infrastructure, and there's a lot of kind of under-functioning of those mills. Elsa refers to backyard milling, not to be confused with front yard milling, which would totally ruin the aesthetic of the mill. This is interesting, though because while the actual growing of the oil palms is sort of forced to be in this heavily forested area, the milling could be anywhere, ideally close by to avoid transportation emissions and costs, but maybe there's a good spot that is close-ish and harms no important ecosystem. Given how challenging all these other solutions are, this opportunity to improve a different aspect of the palm oil process is actually really exciting to me. It's not nearly as constrained as the production piece, and according to Elsa, there's a lot of under-functioning and infrastructure that we can work on. I know it's a small piece of the puzzle, but again, finding this sort of low-hanging fruit is always worthwhile. If this was your first foray into palm oil, I'm sure you're a little taken aback right now as to how complicated this issue is. I'm right there with you. Even knowing a little bit about it going in, I was still pretty shocked. But as major as this issue is, there is a really vibrant discussion about solutions happening. And while I wish those conversations were more constructive, I am optimistic knowing that they're happening. Because if people can agree on a next step and move this issue in a better direction, we can reduce deforestation, save endangered species, protect the climate, stop stealing land, and maybe find a way to avoid a scenario where the only two options are a reboot of Lizzie McGuire or How I Met Your Father. Come on, Hilary Duff. There had to have been a third option. Is your favorite flavor blue? If so, slushies are for you. With slushies, you can taste what it would be like if all the polar ice caps melted slightly and then took a bath in sugary syrup that gave you instant cavities. Seriously, I'm pretty sure a big gulp could hold all the polar ice caps. Thanks, 7-Eleven. Slushies. Sucking ice through a narrow tube never tasted so good. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. Welcome back to The Sweaty Penguin. With me today is Dr. Janice Lee, Assistant Professor at the Asian School of Environment in Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Dr. Lee, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ethan, for inviting me to the show. So let's talk about palm oil. I don't know how much of this sentiment you get in Singapore, but at least out here, I've been a bit surprised to see 
how popular the idea of banning or boycotting palm oil seems to be largely in environmental circles. Now, I don't think I've seen any other food product with that level of opposition before, actually. And it surprised me because with some very quick research, I saw that for all its issues, first off, many smallholder farmers rely on us using palm oil. And also palm oil is way more land efficient than any other alternative. So for all of palm oil's issues, using a different type of oil would lead to other issues. So why do you think there's this ban palm oil sentiment out there and what do you make of it? You know, it can be a bit challenging sometimes to to try to find a way forward because like what you mentioned, in some ways palm oil is helpful because it's very land efficient and we shouldn't just take away palm oil from the markets because we would still need to find uh, a replacement, a substitute oil. Palm oil, of course, contributes to forest loss and peatland loss, largely in Southeast Asia. That creates climate problems, biodiversity problems, etc. Are there enough places to grow oil palms to meet our global demand that don't require deforestation? Where else can we look to grow oil palms? The challenge really is to find suitable, biophysically suitable areas that allow it to grow well. So these typically places which have high rainfall and high temperatures. And that means that you're looking at the tropics. And unfortunately, that's also where, you know, it is also the places of highest biodiversity, uh, very important places for carbon uh, sequestration. There are also places that people, uh, indigenous communities are at. So there's a lot of conflict in terms of like the land that is needed for what use. There have been studies that looked into physically or biophysically where oil palm can be grown. But if we were to use sustainability criterion, for example, not planting over locations which have high carbon stock and also lands which can be improved in terms of their fertility or in terms of their yields um, by growing more high yielding fruit instead of low yielding fruit. So then we could try to meet the production of palm oil at a smaller land space. So these are some ways to try to grow palm oil or to grow oil palm and at the same time to try to maximize our yield and also our production from it. You mentioned before how this tropical land is very often occupied by indigenous communities, which I think is a really important point, especially when you see a lot of countries trying to expand their palm oil operations. So To what extent have these communities, I guess, had a voice in this land conversion, if any, and what more recognition might they need? I think that's definitely a tricky point with the expansion of palm oil. I think that very unfortunately, you know, a lot of the communities do not really have much of a voice in terms of how their land is being managed and also what happens to their customary lands. In some cases, you know, companies do look into this issue and they do try to provide some compensation or they do inform these communities and, and do give them or rather ask them for consent for these kinds of land exchanges. But I think a lot of the communities are often marginalized and not really being consulted when the land is taken from them. I think these processes are also different when we look at you know, what's happening now and what's happening in the past. In recent times, because of the attention paid to sustainability criteria, companies are also aware that you know, they will be charged or they will, there will be complaints that come about if they don't resolve you know, these issues with regards to land conflicts and, and also negotiating with, with the communities and in a fair manner. So I think right now, I think that, that there might be some changes in terms of how the communities are being approached, but we're talking about a very big industry here. You talk about how even with a lot of smallholder farmers of palm oil, there's an increasing amount of industrial operations and investment and just growing palm oil industry as a whole. And I can imagine for smallholder farmers that might might impact them in some ways. So I know you've had the opportunity to interact with some smallholder palm oil farmers What has that experience been like talking to them and how do you feel like they're faring in this evolving palm oil market? 
for the smallholder palm oil sector, it's not always very clear what a smallholder is. I think uh, when we think about plantations, of course, those that run in the tens of thousands, you know, those are definitely big plantations. But there's actually quite a diverse, when we talk about smallholders in, in the landscape, you have farmers that perhaps really own a small amount of land, maybe one to two hectares planting oil palm. You have farmers that then own maybe five to 10 hectares. And then you have farmers that aren't really farmers, they're more like entrepreneurial investors. They live in the cities, they might pay some people to look after their land, but they are not physically present in the land holdings. And some of them are pretty much run like small businesses or small companies. So I think if we are talking about smallholders, you know, it's sometimes easy to pull them all together into one group. But there's actually quite a diverse set of actors when we are thinking about smallholder farmers in the landscape. Generally, I do think that you know farmers are very interested to improve their yields and you know they're seeking ways to try to manage their plantations such that they'll be able to have the highest profits from their plantations so you know they are looking to you know, what are the best seedlings that they can have what are the best fertilizers that they can use uh, what are the best management practices that they can learn from their neighbors or from the agriculture extension officers in their areas to try to make um, you know, oil palm a better crop for them so that they can get more money for their families, for their livelihoods. So, yeah, I mean, I think that depending on, you know, what actors that we're talking about, there's different concerns and also different, I think, agendas about how they would want to use their land or what they are thinking about in terms of like either investing more into their lands or would they consider actually expanding their lands as well? The concerns that small farmers would have. Of course, if we're looking at the bigger actors, you know, not as big as the big companies, then they might be interested in other aspects, investment or to maybe expand their lands. And I think this is the set of actors that we don't really have much transparency about. We don't really know who these actors are because their decisions do affect what happens to the land on the ground. Climate change also affects palm oil, which sometimes gets lost in the discussion. And given that palm oil is already a land use issue, and then you throw in climate change and you think about some palm oil land could become unsuitable for palm oil in the future. So that would mean we might need to move to other land. How do we square that? Can farmers take climate adaptation measures on their current land? Or will palm oil need to migrate to new regions as climate change worsens? And if so, what would be the implications of that? Where oil palm is being planted might not be very suitable in the future because of issues related, especially to flooding. So this is something that is a big problem because money is invested into the land to plant oil palm. And then, you know, now this landscape conversion hazards or or problems related to to production. Also, there have been studies that look into how climate change is also affecting the suitability of working conditions in the outdoors. So when you work outdoors, you're exposed to high heat, high temperatures, and that can lead to heat stress, it can lead to uh, health problems. So it's also an issue not just affecting the trees, but also the labour that's involved in trying to make these agricultural systems productive. So, yeah, I mean, farmers could look into adaptation measures for oil palm plantations. But I think there's not much options, I think, available as well. You know, in terms of like preventing flooding, that would need some kind of coordinated approach to look into why the floods are happening, where is it coming from, what are some of the maybe engineering or some of the nature-based climate solutions that could help to protect, you know, the landscape and reduce, you know, these flooding occurrences. However, they can't just do it on their own by themselves. They have to work together with other farmers or with the government authorities in these lands to, to try to make those changes. Um, and, you know, palm oil might have to migrate to new regions as climate change worsens. And I think that, you know, it really depends on, you know, how these weather conditions, you know, the rainfall and and temperature conditions are going to change in the future to see where palm oil might migrate to other places. I think that 
it also depends on the infrastructure on the ground. So even if you have a place which is biophysically suitable, but does not have the infrastructure, the resources needed to support you know, the development of the oil palm industry, that might also be challenging because when you harvest the fruit, you need to bring it to a mill within 48 hours. If not, the fruit goes bad and the quality of the oil also decreases. So you, you need the development of the mill and that mill requires energy, it requires road infrastructure, even it's biophysically suitable, you know, that's where you can plant oil palm. You still need investment in that kind of infrastructure to be able to also develop an oil palm industry. There have been efforts like the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil to address some of these challenges, but it seems from my research like the willingness to pay a sustainability premium hasn't been broad enough to affect the overall market at this point. And that makes some sense. We're typically not buying palm oil directly. We're buying products that use it. So there's sort of that separation for most consumers. So could demand for sustainable palm oil change if consumers were more educated? Or do you think that private governance solutions might just be inherently a little less effective with a product like palm oil since consumers aren't directly purchasing it the way we might other certification products like coffee or produce or something. I think in some ways you can, you know, try to understand what your product contains by looking at the ingredients. And oftentimes, you know, if it's reported as vegetable oil, there could be some palm oil inside because it's a very generic, commonly used oil and labeled often as vegetable oil. So I think that when we are looking into the products that we are purchasing, to look into the certification labels as a way to support the push and also to support the actors that are trying to produce sustainable palm oil is an important step for the entire supply chain. Um, there are other ways in which you know, we can also try to make that push. So in terms of better, more regulation from governments, in terms of financiers also making that push towards the, the companies that they are uh, loaning uh, money to ensure that they also abide by these um, sustainability criteria. So I think private governance solutions are important. You know, I think that it's not the only solution. You know, it has to come from other important um, actors, for example, governments, um, to also make sure that as we push for sustainable palm oil, there is also implementation of action that protects forests and distributes uh, penalties to companies that do not abide by these uh, non-deforestation kind of uh, methods to, to clear land. Dr. Lee, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks very much, Ethan, for inviting me to this podcast. This wraps up episode 73 of The Sweaty Penguin. Take two minutes, help out the show, and get a shout out at the end of the show by leaving a five-star rating and review on Apple or Podcast Addict, or join our Patreon at patreon.com slash thesweatypenguin. You get merch, bonus content, and more. Clips today came from Daisy Wheel Interactive, Journeyman Pictures, Yale School of Management Case Studies, Business Insider, and Center on Food Security and the Environment. Special thanks to our Emperor Penguin patrons, Lawrence Harris and Brownies Central. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash peril and promise. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you next week.